so I will get that after the announcements, but I will use my outside voice, and hopefully you can hear me as well as our guests who are watching us on Facebook Live. I welcome you to Sherwood Episcopal Church on the second Sunday of Advent, this beautiful day that it is, and um, anywhere, I'm just very glad that you're here with us and that you are here with us viewing because we all are one body in Christ. We all come to the table as one. As we do often and every Sunday as we make our announcements in the, uh, before our service begins, and because it is the season of Advent, after the announcements, I will invite two people forward to help with the lighting of our Advent wreath. But just some things to note, um, for those who are interested in helping um, underwrite the cost of uh, the goodies that we will be providing Cockeysville Middle School 6th graders. Uh, I don't think it's too late to do so, and please do. We are going to be getting about 300 juice boxes and some goodies and putting them in separate bags. So the 6th graders who are being rewarded for some really good behavior in a very difficult time will have a treat uh, when they get to view, I guess, a Christmas music uh, a movie. So we will be the provider of the snack here at Sherwood. And also, uh, last call for those who um, are pledging, and I hope that includes all of you, pledging of time and talent and treasure. Um, and I include you who are visiting us via the Facebook Live. We are all one community, and it takes all of us giving of our time and our talent and our treasure to ensure that we can offer what we offer each and Sunday, and often lots of in-between. Also, yesterday, Charles and I were at the cathedral to watch and witness the ordination of Kathleen Shotto with four other um, ordinands who were, uh, who were ordained as transitional deacons. So for the next six months, Kathleen, along with the four others, will serve as deacons in the church, which gives them some um, ability to read the gospel, to set the table, and really to serve those out in the world, their role as deacons, and we are all ordained as deacons first, is to take and proclaim the gospel out into the world to meet the needs that of uh, the people that so desperately need it. And so I have a card, it's in the back, and I'll bring it around um, for coffee hour, I encourage you to sign it, and we will be sending it to her with a little gift from all of us at Sherwood, and she will be coming to serve as a deacon, hopefully sometime in January, but we will welcome her back. She has been amongst us for many years. And also, I think that is, oh, Advent, the flowers. The flowers for Christmas Eve, we will be having a service here. And as you know, it is a beautiful evening and service that is adorned with all our finery. If you would like to make a donation towards the flowers and the greenery for Christmas Eve and give that in the honor and memory of someone or some, some group of people, as well as Thanksgiving, please do so and fill this out and bring it in. We'll be passing out the plate today. Um, and we will be coming up to the table for communion um, unless you indicate that you would like me to bring communion down to you. And, but we encourage you to place this in the offering plate so that we can honor our loved ones and also adorn this beautiful church on Christmas Eve so, um, and through the season of Christmas. And now, uh, why don't I call forward Charles and Greg, if you can come forward to be a reader. And if you turn to the first, actually on the front page, we'll have the reading for the Advent prayer. Today, we light the first and second candles of the Advent wreath. Each candle has a meaning. The first candle is hope. The second candle is peace. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let us pray. Almighty God, you offer rest for our hearts and peace for our souls. Give us grace to seek peace in our lives, peace in this community, and peace in this world. Through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. 
Merciful God, who sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way for me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days in former years. The word of the Lord. The response appointed for today is Canticle 19, the Song of Zechariah. We will read responsibly by whole verse. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born in the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to the members of all God. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. To give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. To shine on those who Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading is from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, verses 3 through 11. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see your face, that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may, you be, and may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That is, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. Amen. And please be seated. This past fall, Kevin and I were in New Mexico to attend our nephew's wedding and we managed to get in a few extra days to do a little bit of sightseeing in Taos and Santa Fe and where my nephew lived. Throughout our trip, we never tired of the beauty of the vast landscape and the vistas that actually took our breath away. Growing up on the East Coast, the vistas we managed to see are rather limited. The landscape is anything but flat, and the abundance of trees and rolling hills makes it difficult to see for miles and miles and miles. The only time we are guaranteed an extended view is when we climb atop a large hill or a mountain, but then we stand above the earth and not within it. But the Southwest is quite different. The desert terrain is open and vast. There is little hiding in the desert. The poverty and the wealth stand together. It is hard to miss the disconnect between the haves and the have-nots. And the same hold true for the natural beauty of God's creation the rock formations, the wildlife, the flowers, miles and miles of brown and red soil laid bare for all to see. Imagine it. And if you've been there, take yourself back there and imagine yourself standing in that vastness. Yes, the Southwest topography is a sight to behold. And Kevin and I were in constant awe of God's creation surrounding us on our trip to the Southwest. And it was this vision that I held in my head, the vision of a vast expanse of the New Mexico landscape, as I imagined John the Baptist out in the wilderness crying and proclaiming a baptism, the repentance for the forgiveness of sins. From the start of this gospel reading, the writer is pushing against all the expected norms of society. Despite today's gospel leading with a list of who's who, the people who would have the power and the assumed authority to announce for the preparing of the way of the Lord, it is delivered by a large, smelly, strange man forceful in his language, strident in his faith, yet a speaker 
of great truth. Although John the Baptist came from what would be considered a respectable lineage, he doesn't portray this in any way. His appearance and utter devotion to his message makes him stand out. People can't help but to take notice and maybe even be a bit fearful of him and what he has to say. And as we sit here in this tranquil, quiet, beautiful space or review from our homes, enjoying perhaps a cup of coffee, we may wonder, why does Luke lead with this as he introduces his readers to Jesus as our Savior? Why doesn't he lead with someone who is much more regal, who wears beautiful clothes, who stands tall, is clean, and not smelly? Instead, it's John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness. All four Gospels tell of John the Baptist. He is the messenger who introduces the word of Jesus and the word of God and Jesus' ministry. What are the Gospel writers trying to signal to the listeners of the first century and to us here today? You see, St. Luke is setting the stage to introduce the true world that God envisions for all of us. It isn't a world dictated by our self-focused culture, a world that is convinced, convinced beyond a doubt that humanity has control over everything. Luke isn't portraying a world that values those with authority over the oppressed. In fact, Luke is sharing a new vision of our sacred earth, He is turning the world's view on its head and painting a picture of God's dream where every valley will be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. This, this is the first thing that we should take note as we listen for God's message in today's scripture readings, and particularly, particularly during this season of quiet expectation. We need to pay attention. Nothing should go unnoticed. Even the location where John begins his ministry, the wilderness, not a palatial palace, or the Jerusalem temple, as one might assume for the announcement of the coming of the Messiah. Instead, he stands in a dry, desolate, sun-searing wilderness, similar to what Kevin and I experienced this past fall, a place where no one can hide, and everyone is equally exposed to the elements. There's no caves to slink into, No mountains to climb to be above everyone. Just the flat, barren, desert wasteland. Now that certainly levels the playing field, doesn't it? And that this is what Luke is trying to communicate to his listeners of his story. John the Baptist didn't stay quiet. He wasn't afraid to speak the truth, even to the leaders who would eventually behead him. As we read, he went into all the regions around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. God's message was spelled out clearly through John the Baptist, a message that we, too, must heed today as we live into the season of Advent, the season of expectation, the season of revelation, a message that often makes us Episcopalians squirm in our pews. Repentance, wilderness, crying out. Surely can't we have some eloquent prophetic message coming from the mouth of John? No. No, we can't. This isn't an easy passage to absorb. It is a gutsy passage to place in the quiet, reflective season 
of Advent. And that, my friends, is the point. I want us to face this idea of repentance straight on. And perhaps in a way, we may never have envisioned repentance or sin before. Sin can be a difficult word for many. Most of us talk about sin as shameful acts, careless ways when we anger our God. But there's more to sin. It has less to do with our outward bad behavior and more to do with what is hidden within our heart, hidden from everyone, even ourselves and God. I once read a description of sin presented in this way, and I quote it, sin is a refusal to become fully human. It's anything, anything that interferes with the opening up of our whole heart to God and to others and to our creation and even to ourselves. Sin is separation, disconnection, disharmony. It's the slow accumulation of dust choking our soul. Somehow the image of the slow accumulation of dust choking our souls, our thoughts, our actions have more impact than simply listing all the bad things that I have done this past week. I can grasp how my heart can become clogged with stuff that I may not even know is there, preventing me from truly feeling and experiencing and residing with God's love. And so I ask you, I ask you, what needs to be unclogged within your heart and your soul? What needs to be dusted away? What do you need to rethink or recalibrate and more importantly, how are you going to be open your heart fully so that God truly becomes your companion, not someone you call on when it's helpful and convenient? Instead, John is asking everybody to clean their dust bunnies, to invite God to be our constant companion, our helper, our guide, the one who loves us, who forgives us, before we even forgive ourselves. How can we open ourselves up to seeing God in the ordinary, in one another, allowing his love to pierce the darkest parts of our hearts? How are we going to give it over to God instead of believing that through our sheer determination and hard work, we can do it all on our own. My friends, let us all enter the wilderness, a place where we can't hide behind our own bravado or masks, a place where we are laid bare, just as the desert landscape lays everything open, holding no secrets, no hiding places to shield ourselves, from our own frailties. It is when we are able to stand exposed before God that we can begin to look closely at the dust that has accumulated within the crevices of our own hearts. Now last week, I encouraged you to spend five minutes with God. Five minutes, no words, no music, just silence. And I encourage you to read Psalm 23, 25, 1 through 9 that we read last Sunday as you entered into your time with God to prepare yourself. I don't know if any of you tried it. I have. This last week I have added that to my morning mini ritual. And I have to say sometimes I just get off kilter and I forget to pray in the morning. And so this week... I started my day with Psalm 25 and five minutes of silence. 
So this Sunday, I'm going to change it up. And I want you to take the confession of sin, something that we say every single Sunday before we prepare ourselves to stand before the altar of God. I want you to take that confession and I want you to read it word for word. Don't rush through it. Don't think you know the answers. Soak it in. And remember that God has already forgiven you. He knows what it stands before you or in front of you and keeps you from him. Confession is for us to just release and to forgive ourselves, to dust ourselves off. And then, then spend five minutes, and maybe even more, in silence. And when your mind wanders, as mine often does, just gently invite it back. Just gently invite it back. And see what captures your heart. My promise to you is that this can be transformative and it can deepen your faith and spiritual way of being. John's voice is, a, is piercing and grabs our attention. That we know. And it may seem a bit off kilter to how our secular world envisions the days leading up to the birth of Christ. But his cries, his cries will keep us awake and attentive. Otherwise, on Christmas Day, we will miss the beauty and the awe and the grace of God's gift shown to us in a little babe lying in the manger. Amen. And now let us stand as we are able to recite the Nicene Creed as found on page six of your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down by the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate in the Virgin Mary and made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has broken from the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection, and the life of the world to come. prayers of the people. Let us pray. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. And in your name be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your church. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. 
have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they be delivered from their distress. We pray especially for those impacted by COVID-19, as well as those on our parish prayer list. Virginia, Timothy, Margaret S., and family. Louis, Shannon T., Marissa, Bill P., Casey, Betsy, Kiernan, and Colin, Colleen, Lou D., Wayne L., Nancy C., Sheila, Hoa, Diane B., Kaylee, Lorraine, Kathy, Butch, Paige, John M., and Kylie, Kyle. We thank you for the blessings of this life, including those celebrating birthdays, especially Ruthie and Courtney, as well as anniversaries. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light shine upon us. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. My sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another in peace and also our friends who are on Facebook. Turn around and say hi. Just a, a, please be seated. <laughs> First, I want to welcome Bailey as our soloist here today. Is, thank you for sharing your gift of music and your voice with us. She's a friend of Cassidy, so um, she's always a friend. So thank you for joining us here today. Also, we have begun taking communion at the rail. And we will hand out, we will distribute the plates as well for the offering. If you choose or are not comfortable coming forward, by all means tell the usher and I will bring down communion to you and I will bring communion to you, the AV master, um, as well. So don't hesitate to request that. Uh, the ushers will release from one side and go backward and then continue back and forward so that people can easily go up the aisle and, and back down. So we'll start on this side here, Karen, and go straight back and then go across to Sandy and back. Excellent. And now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. And also you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear Rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us in your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, the author of salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God.
us pray our post-communion prayer as found on page 14. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. As we go forth into the world refreshed and renewed, we reaffirm our commitment to our mission as a congregation, saying together, God commands us to enthusiastically cast open our doors to embrace all, impacting lives through bold service, no exceptions. And now, my friends, our worship is over, and now let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.